Good morning, uh, everyone. My name is uh, Cecilia Neige. I'm a postdoc uh, in the INSERM uh, CAPS laboratory under the supervision of uh, Dr. Florent Lebon, who received uh, the ESIT um, Junior Fellowship. So he really apologized for not being here today, but he is uh, teaching at the university. So I'm going to talk about some of the projects we are conducting about the power of mental imagery. So to begin this presentation, let me ask you a very simple question. How can we learn a new motor skill, such as playing piano or basketball or skiing? So you may probably answer that physical extensive practice over several years is often required to learn such motor skill. So this is completely true. However, there are also complementary methods for motor skill learning or motor improvement, such as uh, mental practice by using motor imagery. So just a few definitions. Motor imagery um, is a mental process during which an individual internally simulates body movement without actually executing them. In other words, uh, the person imagines themselves moving, but without uh, overt motion of their body. So mental practice refers to the act of repeating the imagined movements several times uh, with the intention of learning a new ability or perfecting a non-skill. Okay, so now everyone uh, know what is motor imagery. Maybe we can just try together one trial of motor imagery. So it just takes a few seconds. All you have to do is to put your arm in this position and imagine that you are making a very uh, strong contraction of your biceps muscle. So uh, be sure that uh, you, you are not really contracting any muscle. And remember, it is a mental process, so you just have to imagine. Uh, the contraction may, may last two or three seconds. Uh, OK, so maybe we can try together. OK, go. OK, so how did you find it? Was it difficult to imagine the contraction? Yeah. So these, uh, there are two uh, categories of motor imagery. In the first one, the person produces a visual image of its own movement, for example, a visual image of a contraction of your biceps. In the second uh, category, called kinesthetic uh, motor imagery, the subject tries to feel the movement, uh, to imagine the muscle contraction and the tension uh, that he will expect uh, to experience during a real physical contraction. So the last one, the kinesthetic motor imagery, is known to be more effective to uh, induce positive effects after mental practice. So mental practice have, has received a great deal of attention in the last uh, 50 years within cognitive sports psychology. And it is now well established that mental practice with motor imagery is an effective cognitive motor strategy. So mental practice can improve motor learning and enhance physical performance. This behavioral improvement relies on the neural plasticity induction. So neural plasticity refers to the capacity of the nervous system to modify itself functionally and structurally in response to experience, such as mental practice, or in response to injury. So mental practice is effective, effective in both LC participants, but uh, critically in injured patients, for example, after a central or, or a peripheral injury. Indeed, motor imagery is progressively uh, considered as a cost-effective therapeutic tool for motor recovery. For example, it had been uh, shown that patients can reduce their strength loss uh, due to a long-term immobilization with the use of mental practice. So now you know that previous studies provided evidence for the benefits of mental practice, but there is one crucial question that remains. What do we know about the physiological mechanisms underlying neural plasticity induced by mental imagery? 
So this is a proposition for a theoretical model of the neural adaptation of mental practice with motor imagery. I will pass really quickly on this model, but the really important point to see here is uh, that when we imagine uh, the induced activation or the induced activity is not confined within the brain, it also reaches uh, other uh, nervous systems such as here the spinal cord. So, as uh, I said, uh, this model is for now uh, theoretical, and in order to optimize the use of mental practice in clinical setting and in um, uh, clinical rehabilitation program, we have to investigate the neural mechanisms of plasticity induced by mental practice at all stages of the, certain, uh, the central nervous system. So this is the main objective of this project. So this is a schematic representation of the different stages of the motor system in humans. In the lab, we have a set of innovative and non-invasive tools which uh, allow us to quantify the plasticity induced at each stages of the motor system following mental practice. So uh, mental practice such as, for example, repeated imagined muscle contraction uh, like you do just uh, before. So uh, we are interested in uh, the neural plasticity induced within the primary motor cortex, which is represented uh, here. Uh, so we can quantify the cortical and corticospinal excitab excitability changes by the use of mental practice. So the corticospinal tract is uh, illustrated here in red. It is the more important motor pathway for the generation of voluntary movements. We can also assess what happened within the spinal cord, so we can measure spinal excitability, excitability. And finally, we can also investigate if mental practice induced changes um, in a behavioral level, such as uh, in muscle, by measuring behavioral outcomes such as strength or motor performance, depending on the type of mental practice. So in order, in order to have a more concrete idea, this is uh, what happened when the participants come in the lab. So uh, we worked with uh, LC participants, uh, and we used a technique uh, called transcranial magnetic stimulation. So we applied a coil uh, over the, head, the participant's head, and we stimulate the brain in a non-invasive uh, way to um, to evaluate the corticospinal and the uh, cortical excitability changes. We also use uh, electrical nerve stimulation to induce a response that uh, we call the reflexes, and the changes uh, in the amplitude of the response can uh, indicate if there is changing at the spinal uh, cord level. level. We also record muscle activity and finally uh, the wrist uh, strength here uh, with a dynamometer. So the participant is, is uh, tested on day one and then he followed a daily mental training uh, for 10 sessions, so 10 days, one session per day. Um, each training station lasted about 20 minutes and involved 60 imagine muscle contraction. So we are recording muscle activity to uh, ensure that there is no muscle contraction. The participants uh, remained at rest during all the training. And we tested the participants uh, after the end of the mental training, so on day 10, and by comparing all these evaluation uh, between day one and day 10, we can quantify the physiological mechanisms induced by mental practice. So we also tested the participants between 15 and 17 days after the day one in order to see if the changes induced by mental practice uh, lasting, are lasting over the time in a longer time, so not just before the end of the training. 
So, uh, as uh, you can imagine, we have been a little bit slowed down uh, in uh, the last months due to the coronavirus situation. So, this is an ongoing project, and we are actively recruiting new participants. So, if you are interested, uh, do not hesitate to contact me. For now, I can and can not uh, present you a result, but I can tell you that there is a strength increase. Uh, for about 30% uh, when compared to a uh, control group we, who have no mental training. And it seems that uh, all the changes and use are within the brain, so within the primary motor cortex and also within the corticospinal excitability. So thank you very much for your attention. I also want to thank the organizer for this uh, two days conference and uh, Florent Lebon, which is the PI of uh, this project. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cecilia. So we have time for questions. We are only slightly late. There's at least one question uh, over there, hello? one here. So maybe if you can, so one go down and one up. Yeah, probably you can come down if you don't mind. Thank you. So the question comes from FCS. Thank you very much for this very nice presentation. Thank you. I have a question. Do you instruct your, your uh, participant to have a visual or kinesthetic uh, mental imagery? And if, if yes, how do you control that they are actually making uh, visu uh, kinesthetic imagery as it seems to be more efficient? Thank you for your question. So yes, we have a specific um, instruction for the participants. For this uh, project, we focused on uh, kinesthetic motor imagery. So the participants can, just, uh, can also look uh, at uh, his arm, but uh, it's not a problem if he is really focused on the, the sensation, the feeling of contracting a muscle. So we just ensure that there is no muscle contraction, but uh, we can not uh, really uh, um, be sure that is not also visualize uh, uh, what is doing. So I have a naive question. So wh wh what is the, the, uh, the, the, the people that you recruit for these studies? Are these uh, um, people having uh, a lot of training and sportive activities? Is there any difference between people who are highly trained to sport and, and regular people who do not too much sport. Thank you for your question. It's a really interesting question. Um, we recruit uh, uh, students from university, but for each participant, we um, measure with, with a questionnaire the capacity of her imagery. There is a questionnaire that is used uh, largely used in uh, literature. So we, this is just a control. We, we can compare after the training if there is difference between people with good ability to imagine or people with poor abilities. But uh, we're recruiting uh, participants uh, at university, so sports people and, and non sports people. So you didn't discriminate between those participants, whether you know, uh, youngest or the ones that are more in, in sport field are behaving better than the other ones? Maybe I think that sportive people are better to imagine because they really practice uh, motor imagery. When you see a, a basketball player just before he shoots the ball, he just imagine what uh, the, the trajectory of, the, of the, the ball. So maybe sportive people are better with uh, motor imagery, but for now it's uh, young, uh, healthy people and uh, sports even. Okay, because it, it is, you know, in our thought, it is highly used in, in sport, these kinds of approaches, no? Uh, yes, it's, it's uh, used in sports. Yes. Okay, mm. so if there's no other question, thank you very much. So, uh, Cecilia? We have one question, excuse uh, oh, me. Oh, yes, uh, uh, uh. sorry. Yes? Yes. Okay, so still one question. Maybe wait for the micro. Thank you for this uh, speech. I was just wondering if with uh, the use of TMS, are you simulating or you're inhibiting the, the primary motor cortex? And well, you can answer and then I have a second. 
Thank you for your question. So here, TMS is used only to uh, uh, measure corticospinal excitability. But uh, as I mentioned very quickly, we also have a control group. So uh, participants uh, are tested on day one, and they on day 10, and they on day 15, 17. So if uh, TMS uh, induced effect, uh, this is, comp this is uh, comprised within the control group. And the second, are you willing to use uh, TMS in order to stimulate primary motor cortex to improve this uh, mental imagery? Uh, so I think you are talking about repeated transcranial magnetic stimulation. This is um, a perspective. If, uh, if we can show that uh, primary motor cortex is uh, uh, the activity is enhanced after mental training, maybe uh, we can use uh, our TMS to enhance uh, the, the primary motor cortex uh, during training or before training. This is a perspective, yes. And finally, would this be ethic? Um, I mean, is it cheating? Is it like uh, while improving your athletes in case someone wants to use it? Sorry, I didn't hear. Is the... it ethic? Sorry. Ethics. If you are, if, imagine in the future your technique will be used, I don't know, to train uh, Olympic uh, sportives, it would be ethic. Oh, that's that? a, yes, that's a good question. For now, uh, uh, TMS can, uh, our TMS can only be used uh, in a laboratory uh, setting. Uh, it is uh, not uh, um, implemented within clinical settings. So, yes, there is an ethic uh, uh, problem, maybe.